<laughs> okay, we've got everything going. All right, everybody, welcome uh, to this History Respawn live stream. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. Uh, and today we're playing Discovery Tour Ancient Greece, uh, which just debuted for Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Uh, and my guest on today's stream, uh, the person who just described their lunch, uh, was uh, Dr. Kate Cook. Kate, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I promise to make better contributions than that for the rest of this show. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll delete that uh, little aside uh, from Excellent. The, uh, the final version on YouTube. Um, so let's see. We have got uh, Discovery Tour mode going here. This is the PC version. Um, I have got it running on kind of a mid-tier PC with the graphical settings uh, at medium, primarily for running OBS, running Twitch, and running Discord at the same time. So uh, it does look much better than this, but I think I think it looks pretty good. I don't know how it looks on your PC, uh, Kate. Yeah, I mean, so I actually, I play the game on a PC and I have to have everything set quite low because it's quite an old PC. And nonetheless, I thought the Discovery Tour actually manages that quite well. And particularly the kind of distance that you can see behind the character at the moment. You get that in a, and in a lot of the tours quite nicely, right. even if the graphic settings are quite low. So right. I thought that was quite good. Yeah, so we are looking over yeah, uh, the city of Athens. Uh, we are at the Acropolis right now. Uh, and, you know, the draw distance is not bad. You know, this is kind of mid-level uh, PC. A uh, graphics card is a 1650. Uh, and it can look much better than this, but I think this already uh, looks pretty great. Um, so, Kate and I, uh, we have been playing this game uh, separately. Uh, we have got some of the tours that we've uh, looked at, done some analysis of. We'd like to share some criticism, but we thought might be a good idea just to kind of introduce Discovery Tour to people who haven't uh, seen it before. So uh, this is where the game uh, or the tour starts, is at the Acropolis. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the tours, uh, there is in the pause menu a list of all of these various tours here. And you get some divided thematically, uh, and then others are divided based on this interesting timeline that they've included uh, here in the menu. Uh, but whatever way you try to choose the tours, uh, whether by theme or by timeline... Uh, you can do it on the map as well, Yes, you can do it on the which map. Which I quite like. Yes, let's take a look at that really fast. So here's the map, and the great thing about Discovery Tour mode is you get immediate access to the entire map. Uh, whereas in the game, you have to kind of make progress in order to to get to these various parts of the game. And you can see the tours, as Kate mentioned, uh, listed here. And they've all got their kind of little logos. So this, you know, uh, uh, you know there's some related to politics, there's some related to arts, uh, and there's some related to uh, philosophy. Um, and in addition to the tours, the tours are kind of the larger icons here. In addition to the tours, you have these uh, discovery sites, which are kind of like, I don't know how to describe them, they're kind of like mini asides, mini tours um, that provide just a little bit of historical information without any narration. Um, and then on top of that, there's also these uh, historical locations, which don't provide any in-depth uh, historical uh, analysis or any information. Uh, but they do give you this kind of little bit of information, and you can go and look at those locations uh, within the game world. Um, so, as you can see here, there's about, uh, I think there's 30-ish tours that they did. Yeah, you can see some of them I've already filled out. Um, but, you know, there's 30 tours, but then, you know, looking at the map, there's hundreds of these discovery sites and uh, historical uh, locations. So there's a lot here. Uh, so Kate and I thought we might start with this first tour of the Acropolis just so y'all can get a sense of uh, what Discovery Tour has to offer. Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome to the Acropolis, the shining jewel of Athens. And so this is an interesting change, Kate. I don't. Did you play the Discovery Tour for the previous Assassin's Creed? 
Um, not originally, although I have gone and had a quick look at it this morning, actually. Oh, so, okay, great. So the, the guides are new, right? Yes, so, yeah. And yeah. so this is a big change between the two versions of Discovery Tour. In Assassin's Creed Origins, you had this uh, disembodied, godlike narrator coming in whenever you started a tour. Uh, but in this version of Discovery Tour, you have these historical figures who act as guides, essentially, or maybe the historical reenactors is a better way to put it. Uh, yes. And they introduce the tour, and then they also uh, show up at the end of the tour to uh, answer questions and then also to give you a, a short quiz. So uh, let's see who this is. My name is Aspasia. Though I am not originally from Athens, I have climbed to the top of its social ladder using my wits and intellect. I've even earned the love of Pericles, one of the most powerful men in the city. The mind truly is a beautiful thing. So, Kate, what do we make here <laughs> of Aspasia? <laughs> I'm quite glad you brought that up, actually, um, because I thought this was really interesting. So I really like that they've put people in. But I have a slight problem with the using of historical people, because mm. not for all of them, but particularly for someone like um, Aspasia, as she calls herself, or Aspasia, as um, some people might know her. Um, she's quite a contested figure. P scholars you know, still debate quite a lot about what her role was, what her exact relationship with Pericles was, um, how much influence she had over kind of other figures mm -hmm. who are sometimes drawn into kind of their social circle. But obviously you can't have a character say explicitly in a game, I'm a woman and there are some problems people don't <laughs> entirely know who I am. You know, that, that, that isn't going to work. <laughs> so you have to kind of oversimplify or sort of smooth out the potential for doubt here quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, it's, a, you know, in terms of playing through, it's a really nice addition. I slightly prefer the ones where they've got people like Marcos, who is a fictional game character. Yes involved rather than these historical ones just because i think it doesn't invite us to kind of interrogate these figures yeah if you put them in this role uh, well uh this uh, uh wholly fictive version of Aspasia also <laughs> has some thoughts on the acropolis personally i think the acropolis is one of if not the greatest place in all of greece though considering it was the project of my partner pericles i may be a touch biased oh Aspasia. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I like that though. I like that she points out that, you know, there could be some bias here. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, you know, what else do we need from our Assassin's Creed figures except to, to <laughs> known bias? Uh, so let's go ahead and begin the tour so you can get a sense of what uh, Discovery Tour is all about. The Acropolis of Athens is a bastion of art and culture worthy of the gods. So you see, as she's talking here, you've got these tour stations opening up these golden rods that are going into the sky. Some of the most magnificent art in all of Greece. You are in for a very enlightening visit. When you're done, come find me and we can discuss the things you have seen. Farewell for now. All right, so we are going to start this tour, and uh, in order to start oh, tour, you just go head. over to the first tour station, and it's pretty obvious the where to go. The Acropolis has gone through many changes in its long history. It began as a simple rock, was settled as early as the Neolithic period, and then became a fortress in the Mycenaean period. Stone buildings started appearing in the 7th century BCE. But the famous structures whose ruins remain visible today date mainly from a period of construction in the 5th century BCE. The location of the Acropolis is closely tied with Athens' foundation myth. Supposedly, it was the site where Athena and Poseidon competed for the city's patronage. This connection gave the Acropolis a sacred aura, and it was considered the religious heart of the city. All right, so that's the narrator, uh, and again, in the previous version of uh, Assassin's Creed Discovery Tour mode, that was the only other voice that you heard. No historical reenactors, no in-game characters or NPCs providing information. Uh, and then uh, in the tour uh, menu itself, uh, you can look at a, a transcript of what the narrator just said. Uh, which in the previous Discover Tour mode was the only uh, textual information that you got. Uh, so it really kind of doubled up 
the narrator's work uh, in the original Discovered Tour. But in this one, in addition to the narrator's transcript, you also get additional information. So uh, just at the base level, uh, you know, I can't speak to this as a content expert, but at the base level, there's more history in this version of Discovery Tour Mode. Uh, but as far as what to make of that history, Kate, I'm wondering, what do you think of this uh, breakdown between the transcript and then also this extra information? I quite like it, actually. I think what this does, and this is something a couple of the reviews of this tour have picked out as well, is give you quite nice layers of information. So you can just go around these tours and just listen to what the narrator says, which is kind of a very surface level, you know, here is the Acropolis, here's a, a tiny bit of its mm -hmm. history. And then the, for the people who are more interested or, you know, for students and so on, you can take that a step further by reading this extra information. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that you can do that nearly all the way through, although yeah. in some of the other tours we'll look at, I'm going to point out that there are kind of some discrepancies yeah um, so I quite like that kind of layered way of passing on information I think it's going to be really useful for different audiences to get what they want here. yeah and it's great too that you can uh, hide the text and take a better look at the image you know this is a, a modern day image of the Acropolis as it is now 2014 uh, but it does have the credits yeah. uh, for the image and when it comes to uh, a you know material that is in a archive uh, it'll show you what the reference number is for that and which archive it's in which I think is pretty cool um, you know more than I would expect from a video game <laughs> yes yeah the ability for to be able to say to your students okay look at that picture and then and then go and find that precise picture or that precise artifact on the website just by following that link I think is going to be really useful for teaching purposes as well yeah and uh, just for those unfamiliar with discovery tour mode uh, you don't have to worry about uh, being attacked. Uh, you don't have to worry about dying uh, in the game. There's no violence here, uh, and the traversal is uh, pretty easy. I, you know, I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, you do have to kind of learn how to use a controller, uh, but otherwise, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's meant to be an easy experience, easygoing experience without too much uh, drama. Although you can still shove people. Which <laughs> That's true. <Knights> yes. <laughs> I've got a funny story about that in a minute. Sure. From the Mycenaean era, worship at the temple can be traced back to the 6th century BCE. But the building itself was destroyed during the Greco-Persian Wars a century later. It was rebuilt during the Peloponnesian War. Given that the name Athena Nike roughly means Athena of Victory, it was likely constructed in the hopes that Athens would win the war. Unusually, the temple depicts historical scenes of battles against the Persians instead of the more mythologically inclined art of other Greek buildings. The temple's priestess was chosen randomly among the Athenians and received a salary of 50 drachmae annually, along with skins and trophies from sacrificed animals. And here we've got additional information uh, that includes uh, sculptural fragment that we can take a closer look at. Uh, so a lot of these are um, from the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Um, but uh, there are other archives mentioned here, I think, and there's several in France. There's the British Library as well. Uh, so there's yeah. quite a wide array. I mean, you can tell that they, uh, the developers really did quite a bit of research and quite a bit of tracking down of images to, to fill out these tours. And this, I think, actually is a real strength of these tools, the kind of the attachment of that particular image, the fragment of the Athena Nike, being able to kind of put that in its geographical context. So you look at kind of the yeah. temple and then you get a chance to look at an artifact and think about how those things are connected is something which this kind of virtual tour can do really well. Yeah, and I really quite like. Yeah, exactly. And a great thing about a discovery tour mode is that you can also hit... Uh, the right bumper and go into first person uh, perspective. So if you want to, say, climb this structure and get a better look at the detail here, uh, you can. And that's that's pretty nice. You know, you can really mm. tell uh, the amount of work <laughs> must have gone in, the developer hours that went into creating all of this. So uh, occasionally as you're going through these tours, again, these are lighted up with these uh, gold lights. Uh, occasionally you'll come across these purple lights, and these are kind of smaller asides related to the tour. These are called discovery sites. So let's do one of those now. All right, so uh, we've got a discovery site, and this doesn't come with any narration, but it does come with extra 
information and an image. So, um, you know, taking the tour along with all of these discovery sites, uh, I really think adds even more history and much more than you saw in uh, the comparative uh, discovery tour mode in uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. So, uh, yeah. a lot more uh, text, a lot more information, even if it doesn't come with. Uh, the narrator, mm. which might be a good thing, because uh, <laughs> the narrator the could be a little was built overbearing. Up over a long period, due in no small part to its partial destruction during the Greco-Persian Wars, it was in the fifth century BCE, though, that the Acropolis received its most significant improvements. This period was an extremely prosperous time for Athens, both financially and culturally. With a booming economy bolstered by trade and the Lavrion silver mines. Pericles, the leader of Athens, financed a huge project to rebuild the citadel. He enlisted the help of renowned artists, like the sculptor Phidias, as well as the architects Ictinos and Callicrates. Together, they erected buildings like the Parthenon and the Propylia Gateway. Pericles' goal was to make the Acropolis into a glorious monument to the gods and to mortal Athenians. And again, another learn more section here uh, with a Roman bust of Pericles. Mm. I think this is the one I'm most familiar with. I don't know if there's others that are more famous. Uh, no, this is definitely, I think, one of the most famous. Um, and I quite like in this one, the not the bust so much as the text here. It's, oh, the game let me go does back quite to well. That. Oh, sure. I mean, we don't need to. It's just a kind of a note. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent <laughs> shoving. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so you can just sort of see here the fact that it traces the history past um, classical Athens just a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. But I think that's quite good as well, given that it's showing you kind of modern pictures as well. And we've got a Roman bust here. Mm -hmm. This sense that this is not just about a fixed point in history, that there is kind of ongoing history for a lot yes. of these places is quite a nice addition, I think, to this tour. Yeah, Something absolutely. they paid attention to. They do that a few other times uh, on some of the other Doing tours. There's mention the of, uh, let me get through this narrator. <laughs> um, there's a mention of, you know, how uh, historians, archaeologists uh, use this material in the past and how it's uh, presented today uh, and thought about today. Yes. So that's, that's also interesting. It's also uh, an important part of the history of how we understand mm. these things now. Absolutely. So here we've got NPCs uh, kind of milling about and the activity of the NPCs here, the non-player characters, it mimics pretty closely what you would see in the actual game. And what's great about their inclusion here in this version of Discovery Tour mode is that the last Discovery Tour for Ancient uh, Egypt didn't necessarily make the best use of the game, and in particular made the best use of the NPCs. So, uh, you know, when we were talking about the uh, smaller temple of Nike there, uh, they had the builders working on it. You know, that kind of adds a layer of understanding for the player that wasn't present in uh, the Discovery Tour mode for Ancient Egypt. So I think this version of Discovery Tour is definitely making better use of uh, non-player characters. Behind the Propylia was the giant bronze statue of Athena Promachos, or Athena who fights on the front lines. That name was reflected in the spear and shield the statue held in its hands. It was erected in the mid-5th century BCE by the artist Phidias. According to an inscription, it took nine years to make and cost almost half a million drachmae. At approximately 10 meters tall, the statue was apparently so large that Pausanias claimed its helmet and spear tip could be seen from the sea near Cape Sunion, 60 kilometers away. The ornamentation on the statue's shield was engraved by the metalsmith, Mies. So, uh, if I can just kind of intervene, Please. that that um, shot of the Athena Promachos, it, it shows quite nicely something which I find a little bit frustrating about this tour, actually. Um, we mentioned how good it was that you get the image credits, and you can see, actually, you've got one for this vase again, so people can go and find that information. But where literary sources are repeated. So Pausanias said X, uh, for example. Pausanias said you can see the spear tip from the coast. Um, we never get 
where that is. We don't get sources on any of these. Mm. And I think that's a really, that's a shame. Yeah, so you can see it here. Pausanias yeah. claimed its helmet and spear tip. It would have it would not have taken that long to just put even just at the bottom of this bit the transcript bit where in Pausanias you could find that so that anyone who's finding that interesting can go and look at more at the moment you can't you'd have to look through all of Pausanias um, mm. which would take quite a while yeah so I found that slightly frustrating the lack of sort of specific references I know that you know many general audiences won't necessarily want that but for school students or undergraduate students or indeed anyone who just wants to read a bit more about this statue and what Pausanias said about it, it's going to be harder for them to do that. Right. And, you know, you kind of and this is the question I had for last year's uh, version of Discovery Tour or the previous version of Discovery Tour uh, was, you know, who is this for? Um, you know, mm. I think interested players, curious players who play Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you know, obviously they'll get this for free and they'll probably be interested. They'll, you know, it will add to their gameplay. But uh, if you're taking this out of the context of playing video games and, uh, you know, doing it for entertainment and putting it in the context of the classroom, I think these are the type of questions, you know, as you uh, rightly point out, these are the type of questions you have to ask yourself. You know, we should also include uh, source information as much as possible. Uh, so that, you know, teachers, instructors can have a good deal or at least a little bit better uh, faith in this content uh, and mm. make it more useful for students and for the classroom in general. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a shame because they've done it so well for all the images. You, yes. you know exactly where they're coming from and what they are and, and, you know, where people can find them now. And I'm wondering if that's maybe a copyright issue. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think... Uh, for the images, they probably uh, need to include that information simply to um, cover their butts, uh, not be sued by the Getty Museum or something like that. Uh, but they don't necessarily need to do that with an ancient text. Uh, so I, that, that could, could play into it. Very possibly, although that's quite cynical, so that's the quite a Air sad thought. So. <laughs> the the ages of seven this is where my mind goes. Who were in charge of special <laughs> rights. A list of four girls was drafted by the Assembly of Citizens, from which the High Magistrate, the Archon Basileus, chose two to serve as Arafuroi. And here we've got some NPCs the the uh, working they were in charge of to build up the story here. And, the and they aren't doing Athena. much, but they are present, the which is more than you could say for NPCs in Discovery Tour in Ancient honor. Egypt. So again, it might look a little bit awkward, but comparing this to... Uh, the previous version of Discord Tour, this is much better. Okay, we're a little over halfway here. I'm going to try to get through the rest of this tour as quickly as possible so we can make our way to some of the other content. Uh, Kate, I forgot to ask you before we started, what what kind of time do you have for our stream today? I don't want to overburden you. As long as you need, really. I've written off this afternoon to do this. <laughs> as long as would be useful or interesting. Awesome, <laughs> great. founder of Athens, his son Erechtheos, and even Poseidon, the sea god who challenged Athena for possession of the city. The temple was divided into sections. The eastern part housed a statue dedicated to Athena, while the western section jointly belonged to Poseidon and Erechtheos. Meanwhile, King so, grave was I think the under the that this tour works pretty well, primarily because this is a historical site that people go and visit and take to tours of. And it feels like, at least in terms of the narrative presented by the narrator and by the text, that a lot of this information could have been pulled from one of those tours. I've never been to the Acropolis myself. Um, but... This tour, this uh, particular Acropolis tour, feels like it is much more, um, what is the right word? Much more coherent and yes. uh, much better stitched together than some of the other tours that are included in this game. I don't know what you thought, Kate. Yes, I agree, absolutely. Um, and I think, I think 
the kind of the geographically sightedness of it. If I, I mean, I know that's that's not a phrase either, but but the fact that it kind of it works as a location which kind of your character can move around and that information is connected to all of those locations that you go past mm-hmm. is really valuable. Um, whereas for some of them, and there was one that I kind of noticed in particular that had a real problem with this, there isn't any connection or there isn't any obvious connection between where you are in the game and the information you're getting. And then it starts to feel almost pointless. Like yes. you could just read that information off a page. You the don't need to be kind of connecting it to the game. Well yeah. Whereas this, you world. don't feel that at all. You yes. get the chance to explore the space and then learn about the space you're exploring, While it is which is really good. On the, Acropolis, the building is not a traditional temple. It was built by the sculptor Phidias and the architects Callicrates and Ictinus as a great monument to the glory of the city of Athens. And I should say that this that glory is narration with the panning carvings. kind of documentary-esque of shots of, of whatever you're looking at, uh, here we've got the Parthenon. Um, this also was not a part scenes. of the uh, original the uh, version Athena, of Discovery Tour for Assassin's Creed for the Origins. Of Athens, uh, yeah, instead, the God, you would just have a static giants, uh, image, which you could kind of slightly pan around. Uh, but it wouldn't be these moving tracking shots, and I think that this version of it uh, is much more effective. It does kind of give it a, 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 a documentary feel, which some people might have a problem with, but I feel like it's it, it's a bit more uh, effective than the previous mm. version of this this mode. Yes, I agree, and particularly for things like the, precisely that Parthenon part, where where it's kind of showing you the reliefs and then talking about what's on the reliefs, mm-hmm. it works really well. It, it, it particularly, I think, if you didn't really know what you were looking for, mm-hmm. it shows you what you're looking for, and that's that's ideal. So I agree. I think that works. Just a couple more tour stops here, and then we can have a quiz. <laughs> okay. Hope you're taking notes, because I certainly the have not. The Parthenon's inner chamber, or cella contained a massive statue of Athena that was considered to be one of the sculptor Phidias's greatest masterpieces. The statue was chryselephantine, a combination of gold and ivory. It's a vocabulary word for the day. <laughs> cost of its construction, <laughs> uh. Pericles told Athenians that the statue was a gold reserve. They have mixed success with vocabulary, actually. Sometimes they explain it, and then sometimes they just don't, or you have to look at the more information to find out what the word meant. And that's a bit kind of mixed. Again, it's it's about who is your audience. If you're expecting classic students to be looking at this, then fine, they probably know what a, a karyatid is. But if you're expecting general players, then they probably need that information before they go into the more information. Yeah, and I think... And I'm not... Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think the context really matters. The audience matters, as you said. Mm. And I'm not sure that's kind of consistently been thought of all the way through. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, perhaps it has. Perhaps I'm just not sure who the audience is, but... We're going for a nice little jog here. You can see countryside in the distance. <laughs> Trying to move as quickly as possible. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> I should say that um, I, I did go to uh, Crete and uh, visit the Minotaur. And uh, they actually have the physical Minotaur uh, in uh, the underneath the palace. And you can also bump into him. And he'll kind of do the same sort of... Uh, stumble animation as a regular NPC, which I thought was quite hilarious. That's fantastic. Athens' treasury was located in the park. In the game, of course, they abuse you for running into them. Athena yes. Herself. So it's it's quite the nice that they're a bit calmer in this. You don't get that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> you don't get cursed at, well yeah. Yes, exactly. ...silver coins and various offerings to Athena. Pericles also decided to move the entirety of the Delian League's treasure to the Parthenon in 454 BCE. This was so this, a great testament to I, I played this power before, this tour. This struck me as a bit odd that they would just leave the parts, treasury the Demosia, in a building city, like this. I suppose Hermita, nobody would risk stealing it for fear of for upsetting purposes. the gods, perhaps? I don't know. It, it seemed a little risky. Well, there is... I mean... 
there is quite a lot of discussion in the ancient world, not just among the Greeks, the Romans do it as well, the kind of keeping of riches in temples. Mm -hmm. um, and quite famously, when uh, Sulla, who was a Roman general, invaded Greece um, quite a lot after this game is set, he took a lot of riches from temples and brought them back to Rome. Um, and some people thought this was just disgraceful behavior, particularly, of course, Greeks found this disgraceful because he was raiding their temples. Mm. Um, some people didn't seem quite so fussed. It's, I mean, it's worth saying that actually what having all these people around doing uh, whatever they kind of fancy in the tours does quite well is show that this is going to be quite a busy place. Yes. Um, there are going to be priests around. There were probably priests around um, and temple guards we know existed and so on. So it's not, you know, they wouldn't have just been kind of left here in the temple and then no one went near them. So you could just help yourself. There would have been people around most of the time. <laughs> well, so they're probably relying there's on There's nobody that here part. now. I feel like I should just nick well. something. <laughs> I quite like this shield. <laughs> Yeah, there probably would have been some guards hanging around. And this this golden foot that's just randomly yeah. here on the floor. Yeah. All right, let's let's go to the conclusion of this tour so we can give our viewers a sense. The and quiz. Of the quiz. Of it truly is quite something, isn't it? A sacred sanctuary and an architectural marvel, all in one. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, so, uh, the avatar for the player here, uh, this is uh, Cassandra uh, from the game, uh, but unfortunately, they, whichever avatar you pick, and you've got a list that I could show you after this quiz, um, they remain a silent uh, avatar. So, there's some moments where Cassandra will uh, furrow her eyebrows or make a strange gesture or smile, but there's no words that are going to come out, which I think is, it makes sense for this game mode, but it's a little disappointing because the voice acting in the game is, I think, really excellent. Mm, it is. All right, are we ready for the quiz? Um, yes, why not? Okay. You're confident enough for a test? Very well. Let us see how much you know. It's a little bit too Which much. Two gods competed for Athens's patronage. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. I want to say Poseidon and Athena. It is, yeah. Oh, great! Awesome. Correct. It was Poseidon and Athena who fought for Athens's patronage. As for who won, the answer is in the city's name. Oh, On to nice. the next question. Who right. sculpted the statue of Athena in the Parthenon? Okay, I know this one. Um, I should say, uh, just for our viewers, that uh, Kate is the content expert. She's the classicist. <laughs> I, I'm a modernist. Uh, anything that happened after 1800, I'm your man. Uh, but otherwise, uh, correct. The renowned it's, uh, sculptor Phidias made it's a bit of a struggle. <laughs> but actually, I mean, that ties into something which I think is quite good about question. these quizzes. Which They're asking you the stuff they've just to told you. The yes. Porch. Okay, so this one we skip through, so you may or may not remember it. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, I'm going to guess here. That is it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb luck. And yeah, so they won't, they don't, even on some, some of this, it this is actually one of the slightly easier quizzes. Well done, some Andre. of them, they ask you something which they've only mentioned very briefly or which you only find in the extra information, but it is always something you will have come across on the tour. I right. haven't found anything yet that they ask that you need kind of extra knowledge for, which I quite like. Good. Yeah. And I think the presentation of the quizzes, I mean, three questions, I think is the right number. Um, I think the type of questions that they're asking are pretty appropriate you know i'm thinking mm. in terms of you know if you are playing this game uh you know most video game players are between the ages of you know 12 and 30 uh so that seems about right for the educational level and you know it's something i think could work in a classroom setting particularly if you're talking about i'm thinking of the american context in grade school um you know mm. that could work in that context where it's about comprehension of material that you've just heard rather than something outside uh, of that material so i don't know I, I feel in terms of educational quality it's it's good it's fine you know it's it's much better than i would expect uh, to be honest i don't know what you think kate no i i agree i think the quiz is one of the 
the, almost one of the best additions to this, actually, in comparison to Origins, because, it, as you say, it gives you a chance to test comprehension. Yeah. Um, it's worth saying, if you get something wrong, she doesn't say, no, you idiot. She tells you um, <laughs> either about the answer you've selected or she kind of explains why it's not quite right. And then you have another chance to do the question again. Right. She doesn't then give you the answer. So in that regard, again, it's it's quite nice for sort of just giving you a chance to test your knowledge and see how much you can remember of what's been said. Right. I, I actually intended to get the last question wrong so we could see that, but oh. <laughs> I accidentally got it right. So, so much for that. Uh, all right. Well, let's, let's move on. Hopefully we will see each other again soon. All right, and you notice down there uh, to the bottom right, it has a tally of the tours that you've done and the discovery sites that you've encountered. And that's important because unlike the version of the game that went along, Discovery Tour that went along with Origins, this version for Odyssey uh, keeps a tally of the tours and discovery sites that you've done. And that plays into the characters, the avatars that you get to use. So you could see some of them here are locked and you have to complete a certain number of tours or find a number of discovery sites in order to use them as your avatar. So it kind of gamifies discovery tour mode, which I think is a good idea because uh, in playing discovery tour for uh, origins really the only thing that was pushing you along was your interest in the history uh, whereas here you're, you're getting you know some kind of game element and you know educators might scoff at that and say oh well that's ridiculous you should just want it for the love of history and information but you know not everybody's built that way so I think having these things having uh, kind of a gamified section where you can get new avatars or new mounts I, I think that helps the game Yes, me too. And it keeps track of those quizzes as well. It checks whether yes. or not you've actually done the quiz at the end of each tour. Mm -hmm. So again, if you were using this kind of in a classroom setting, particularly with younger kids, it would not be too difficult to kind of set it for an hour or so and say, right, now I'm just going to have a look at, you know, how much have you done? How many characters have you unlocked or how many tests did you do? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a tiny bit of accountability, both for the player themselves to encourage them on and to someone else to have a look and see whether your student's been doing anything or whether they've just run off the map somewhere. Somewhere, which yes. you can do on these tours, and yes. which I'm not sure is a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think also with these uh, available avatars, it tells you if they are um, fictional or uh, if they were a real person. Uh, so, for instance, we've got Pythagoras here uh, with a little bit of information on him. Uh, he looks like he's uh, very comfortable in his getup. Why don't we? Why don't we change? Uh, to Pythagoras and see what he looks like. I haven't done this yet, actually. Oh, there he is. So again, this gives you a reason to, uh, uh, you know, complete the quizzes, or to complete the tours, rather, to complete the discovery sites so that you can have uh, mm. different avatars and you can have Pythagoras uh, climb a building, as you always hoped he would in your dreams. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a quite a specific hope. Really. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, why don't we move into some of the tours that uh, we've gone through? And Kate, uh, I'm wondering if you've got something uh, in particular, a tour that you'd like to go through and kind of consider for the audience. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I work on Greek theatre. Um, that's my kind of main research area. So I thought we could perhaps have a look at the theatre tour. Okay. Um, because, I mean, perhaps it's a little bit unfair, but I think it's quite interesting to see how these stack up. Um, I mean, I know about the Acropolis, but it's not kind of my specialist area. Sure. Whereas this is. So seeing how they kind of compare was quite interesting for me. And right. And hopefully and be interesting for other people. Yeah. And uh, the great thing about Discovery Tour, this is in the last version as well, but you can come here to the pause menu, uh, go to the subject matter you're interested in, look at the list of available tours. And then once you find a tour you're interested, it gives you the number of stations and an estimated uh, playtime, which I think is helpful. Mm. could be really helpful in a classroom setting. And then once you've found it, you don't have to actually physically traverse there yourself. You can if you want, um, but otherwise you can just hit A and it'll take you right there. Mm. And then you get this, Which is uh, nice. this strange loading screen with uh, Greek text floating by your head. <laughs> 
Yeah, so some, I mean, quite a lot of the tours are set in Athens, so you could just explore and go into kind of all the Athenian tours, look at some Athenian politics, the Acropolis, the Athenian theatre. But for the ones that are a bit more distant, particularly, again, if you're in a time-limited setting like a classroom, I don't think you want to be telling your student, OK, first you have to run to the other half of the Greek world, yes. and then we're going to do a tour on Sparta. Yes. Yeah, and so, in fact, I could have just jumped off the Acropolis and gotten here, but... Uh, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> oh, here's our friend, our tour guide. Welcome, wanderer, to one of the most prestigious places in Greece, the theater. All right. So, what are we? What is I our you, version of Aspasia thing? Best to let the Apparently, speak nothing. For <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, that was worth it. All right. So, this yeah. is actually a tour I haven't played, so I am I'm curious. Okay. But you know, chime in the whenever you want to. Sure. gather to watch plays. They were the highest form of art in Greece, and people saw theater as a symbol of complete harmony between the mortal world and the divine. When you're done taking in the sights and sounds, come see me, and we'll talk more. Until then, wanderer. <laughs> And you see here, at the bottom of these two NPCs, there's these white um, circles. And you can see these uh, throughout the game, uh, particularly near tour sites. And if you uh, go and stand on one of those white circles, your avatar will momentarily turn into uh, an NPC, a non-player character, and will kind of act out a role uh, based on the location uh, at that time. Um, so we'll see if we can find some more of those white circles as we continue. Theater is not just part of geek culture, but was a major oh. part of Greek I don't really know what that means. Oh, <laughs> what is that? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that was tragic. Yeah. Unfortunately, this tour, I, this tour had some really good things and some really bad things, apart from the bad joke. I found this tour a bit frustrating with how quickly it starts oversimplifying things. Mm. So the origin story of theater we just got immediately immediately from after the bad on, joke is also I mean this where exactly theater comes from we don't know and, and it would have taken two extra words to say was perhaps century BC derived from cult performances or you know mm -hmm. some scholars think it often functioned so I found the lack of doubt here quite frustrating mm. and in some cases it could they're a bit too confident for your taste they really result, are yes in the fourth century BCE here is kind of the, an example of the same thing to describe his city's politics. So Plato complains about the influence of theatre on politics, but this is another kind of example where we're not getting allowance for bias. Plato has a real thing about poetry and theatre being too influential because, again, this is an oversimplification, so kind of other classicists, please don't write to me and say how bad this is as a view. But, <laughs> but really, it's because Plato wants philosophy to be the thing that people are turning to to understand mm -hmm. politics and so on, rather than theatre. There's a kind of competitive element to it, or at least that's partly what's influencing what he says. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this kind of presentation, we just get told, you know, this is the truth. Theatre yeah. is just enormously influential. There's, there's much less allowance for doubt here, whereas on the Acropolis tour, they did allow for doubt sometimes. They right. say, for example, this temple might have been built for this reason. Once you start getting away from some of that architectural detail, they, they suddenly drop all of the might and they go straight into certainties, which are not always entirely accurate. Right. Well, we've got quite a bit of uh, extra material yes. here. Uh, so what do we make of this for the Greek theater section? Um, this is mostly good, although I hate to say there's a factual inaccuracy in this uh -oh. bit, which uh -oh. alarmed me quite a lot. <laughs> it's the only one I've found so far. Um, the Persians is not Aeschylus' first tragedy. Ooh. It's huh. the first tragedy that we've got. It's the earliest, it's the oldest tragedy that we've got that survived, but it definitely wasn't the first one he produced. Mm. Tough look. So, yeah, mm, well, that's unfortunate. Well, we'll, uh, we'll collect our criticisms here. We'll send it into <laughs> the developers, make sure that they uh, they update the next edition, right? That's, that's the hope. That's how it works in the mm. book world, right? Um, yeah, it is. Do you know if they did that at all with Origins? Are I, they, you know, are I they have, interested? I in have no idea. Um, you know, I know they, they talk a big game about having historical experts consult mm. on this, but, you know, I don't know 
the background story of that you know how much mm. input those experts have you know are they actually writing this material or are they simply giving the developers uh, book recommendations that they then go and use to adapt material off of i i have no idea um mm. but yeah uh that's that's too bad okay as i say it's the only kind of complete inaccuracy i've found so far so oh, that's not bad well but. yeah Theatrical competitions were held in the sanctuary of Dionysus Eleutherios, god of wine and patron of drama. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and a mortal woman named Semele. Stories say that Zeus, who had fallen in love with Semele, appeared to her holding a lightning bolt in his hand. Semele was tragically struck dead by the lightning, but Zeus managed to save her unborn child keeping the embryo hmm. in his thigh until it fully gestated. Interesting. This is why the name Dionysus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, <laughs> in Athens, this is in some ways, okay, it's an interesting story, but this is starting to be one of these examples. The it gets better. The other stations on this tour like don't do it so much, but where you're getting kind of information which is not really relevant. Mm. Um, I mean, it is a bit relevant. They are festivals held in honor of Dionysus, but this is much more relevant, this information about kind of the shape of the theatre and the sanctuary and mm -hmm. so on, to what we're seeing in games. So I almost would prefer more of this to be in the main narration. Right. To help preserve that kind of connectedness that we were talking about as being so good on the Acropolis. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on. Certainly interesting background information on Dionysus. Did not know that. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it leaves him with some hang-ups in Greek tragedy as well. Oh. In Athens, there were three festivals that honored Dionysus with drama performances. The Rustic Dionysias, the Linnea, and the Great Dionysia. For the Rustic Dionysia, each Demi of Attica organized their own Dionysiac procession. The parades were full of phallic songs, dances, and symbols meant to signify fertility. And participants wore drunkard masks and sang body lyrics about the god. Hmm. The Linnea was the oldest Dionysian festival. It was exclusively reserved for Greek citizens and mostly made up of comedy performances. Finally, the Great Dionysia was the most important festival. Taking place over several days, it began with a parade called a phallophori, followed by a dithyram contest, and ending with consecrated drama competitions. Mm, so what do we make of that? Well, so some of it I really like. I like that it kind of explains the festival context, the fact that there are sort of multiple festivals going on. And I think a lot of people don't, you know, when they think about Greek tragedy or Greek drama, they think of it as being theatre in the same way we experience theatre, that you just sort of, you decide, I'm going to go and watch Sophocles' Oedipus, and then you go along to that in the evening. Mm -hmm. And this does quite well at showing that that isn't how theatre happened. They didn't kind of have runs. They just happen at these festivals. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very important information. I wonder though, as someone who doesn't kind of work in this material, do you know what themes, things like a deem or a dithyram are? No idea. Yeah, so this is where I start to wonder about kind of where they are and aren't defining vocabulary. Right. Um, I mean, and, you know, I have the context from the game and, you know, the theatre yeah. plays a pretty big role in, I'd say, mm. the middle third of this game uh, and I think in particular there is a uh, you know a couple of theater performances um, that you know plays along with the narrative of the game and the politics within the game and so you know some of the words are familiar you know some of the concepts are familiar from that but you know other parts of it you know a lot of this is completely new to me so mm. you know I think uh, again it begs the question about audience you know is this being uh presented in the context of just playing the game in which case i think this is pretty good oh here's mm. one of these white things and so now we'll have our npc uh just standing there i guess usually <laughs> usually they act out uh whatever role is being done oh here he goes a little bit there we go Pythagoras. get into it yeah all right um <laughs> Oh, I see. Oh. I'm taking his spot. Sorry, um, <clears throat> I'm being upstaged. Uh, but uh, but again, I think if you have got a classroom context, um, you know, the, I think the teacher, the professor, the instructor would kind of have to be aware of some of these issues going mm. in. 
Um. The great Dionysia was supervised by the head magistrate known as the Archon, who was assisted by 12 other magistrates. Among his duties, the Archon picked Korrigoi. Rich Athenian citizens See there, they've explained the what that means, yes. which is quite useful. Yes. That's that's the kind of thing I'd like to see the more consistently, really. A ceremony really. called the Proagon took place where playwrights introduced their work. The Dionysia finally began in earnest with a procession to the god's temple. And it's something that wouldn't take that much more than just an extra clause, right? I mean, it's... Exactly. Contests. Yeah. While the final four days yeah, that's that's the thing I find a little bit frustrating. The is they're so close. Yeah, I only want you know three to five words more really yeah. to make this icon. ideal. The judges placed their votes in an urn, and five of the votes were randomly picked to determine the winner. Oh, we've got somebody in the chat who mentioned uh, it would have been oh. great if they'd included a glossary. Um, yes, and that that's an interesting comment because. In older versions of Assassin's Creed, there used to be the database in the pause menu. So in, you know, say in Assassin's Creed 2 or 3 uh, or Black Flag, you would come to the pause menu. There would be a section up here that would be a database. And it would include historical entries for things that you'd encountered in the game. And some of those would be glossary uh, entries, right? Essentially defining words. Um, but since the advent of Discovery Tour, they've taken out the database from the regular game, uh, which I think is unfortunate because I think, you know, mm. not a lot of people will actually play uh, Discovery Tour mode compared to the number of people who play the game. And I would I really wish they put the database back in uh, to the regular game, if not just for the glossary, then All for the rest of the history. Mail portrayed in the game. Of whether they were playing men yes, or given that they're obviously Tragedies gathering all that information. Only yeah. One actor performing It'd be quite useful to course, have that here. Eventually reaching a maximum of four. Adding more roles opened up the opportunity for dramatic dialogue. During performances, they prepared themselves... What do we think of the presentation here of the, the theater and the backstage and the, the stage itself? Or stage. The skin <sighs> so this, I'm afraid, is another thing. Like this is why I thought this was quite an interesting one to do, because once you kind of introduce a specialist, it starts to fall apart a bit. <laughs> this is something which, again, I thought they did so much better on the Acropolis and didn't do very well here, in that this is kind of quite a late representation of the theatre, um, particularly the kind of inclusion of a stage area. Um, and when they talk about having four actors rather than three, um, that might not come in until possibly the very end of the period in the game, if not possibly even later the um the kind of the use of a fixed building they will explain that the fixed building is a kind of a later de a development that happens um as part of the kind of progression through time that mm -hmm. the theater undertakes but i felt that it could be in this tour they could be much more explicit about sort of the time that we're in in the game and how much of what they tell you here is and isn't actually relevant to that right. Again, Whereas just it a, seemed to me, oh, yeah, sorry. just a little bit more information, I think. Yeah, and it, it just seemed that was the kind of thing which I was quite pleased that I thought they did quite explicitly and quite well when they were talking about the buildings on the Acropolis, and hadn't quite carried over into this tour. Mm -hmm. um, the centerpiece of the theatre was the orchestra, or dancing place. It was a large circular area that hosted choral performances religious rites, and presumably, acting. Choruses were composed of men wearing masks and costumes. Any Athenian citizen could be Koratai, as long as they were selected by the chorus director. Chorus members also served as the equivalent of a curtain, as their hmm. entrance and exit marked the beginning <laughs> and end of the play. New That's a little bit of an oversimplification. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And they don't always. Just as impressive and elaborate as the performances. I was going to say, that example, was quite a tambourine that guy had. Feature the chorus yeah. dressing as wasps, frogs, birds, clouds, and islands. Islands. One hmm. of his plays, yeah. The Knights, Aristophanes' had chorus is all fantastic. Dressed as horses. Do the islands speak? Um, they're a chorus, so yeah. Wow. 
That's like, kind, of, I mean, it's the kind of theater I want to go to. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we do any of these uh, side sections? Um, or you can we... do. Uh, the one for the altar of the Di of Dionysus is quite good. Oh, where's um, that? Just as a reminder. So, oh, I can't remember which one of these is. It back is. here, I guess. Uh, no, that, so the altar, if you go back into the center of the orchestra. Um, oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the altar, so I think it might be that one just okay. to your right. Let's see. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. nice. Ooh, we're going through Pythagoras' head here. Yes. But I quite like that it does that. It doesn't make you look around. It shows yes. you what you're supposed to be looking at. That's quite important. Yes. So here, this is what I find so frustrating about some of the other bits. Because look, they've got it exactly there. Mm -hmm. Some archaeologists have suggested the altar was actually on the side. There has been debate about whether or not it was a permanent fixture in the theatre. It's one extra sentence. That's all I needed in yeah. some of the other bits of this tour. Right. It's just that kind of awareness of doubt, that willingness to say we don't really know exactly what's going on here. Right. You know, I. It's curious. I mean, this was a part of Discovery Tour for Origins as well. This kind of mm. lack of doubt, and you know, I'm wondering, it it might have to do with the kind of I don't know if this is Ubisoft's problem or just kind of the general public awareness of what history actually is I think that mm. you know most people on the outside looking in they consider history as something that's definitive and that if it's in the textbook then it's something that we know a hundred percent whereas mm. you know as trained historians of people who do this for a living you know we know that uh, the the truth is contextual right and our conception of it changes over yeah. time and we are much less willing to be definitive on certain aspects of the past now there is of course you know such and such things happened at such and such states you know columbus sailed the ocean blue 1492 all of that but there are you know elements of the past like this where mm. it does need to be a little bit contingent um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I mean it would be again it would be quite interesting interesting to hear from anyone in the chat if there is anyone there who kind of isn't familiar with the history. Do they find this kind of where they have indicated this doubt? Do they find that a problem? Yeah. Because if not, then I would think that's just something they could do throughout really or do you know do you find it disturbing to find yeah. out that we don't really know where this altar was supposed to go? <laughs> <laughs> Truth, truth bombs here during the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Athens Teatron, or performance space, could seat up to 17,000 people, nearly a tenth of the population of Attica. Its excellent acoustics made it ideal for drama, but it was also sometimes used for political meetings and parades. The theater was accessible to everybody. This did not mean that seating was free, though. Uh -oh. I don't really know what they mean in that case. Oh, really? Public officials sat. While the central part of the well, I mean, what are they defining as accessible? If, in fact, honor. it's not that everyone can just go in. And, women sat and this is not in necessarily general, true. Hmm. We don't actually know if women were even allowed to be in the audiences of theatre. Uh, There's been an awful lot of debate about that. That's something I think that we talked about possibly on the first podcast we did. Yes. Here they've gone for men and women sitting separately. They might not. Women may or may not actually have even been in the audiences. Ah. It's hotly debated. Hmm. Emotional and noisy. Yes, particularly for comedy, but we're pretty sure for tragedy as well shouted out or exclaimed or right. even I mean certainly for comedy there was some there's a complaint in one of Aristophanes plays that the audience were booing all the time in the last <laughs> time he did a version of this play <laughs> so he's tried to improve it so we know they were they were really vocal they obviously didn't have a problem right um, which is quite interesting when you kind of compare that with rightly what they said at the beginning of this tour that the theater is part of a religious festival right um, that doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't mean they treat it as being in church. You know, it's, right. it's their experience of how this festival worked is, again, is quite different to how we might expect when we think of what theatre is. Uh, I should also mention we just had the eagle land on my arm. Uh, you can change to the eagle's perspective uh, by pressing up on the directional pad, uh, and you can get a bird's eye view, literally, of the surrounding area. And it, this can help you spot out different tours uh, you can see in the distance you've got the map icons there uh, and they could show you where tours are but then also where these discovery sites are um, so it's 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 pretty handy 
as well as being a lot of fun to just fly around. Alright, let's go here to Hello the quiz. Again, Wanderer. I hope your visit was entertaining. Though all art forms were important in Greek culture, none had the same prestige as theater, which provided a unique experience with every performance. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Well, I suppose we have to take the quiz. We probably should. Then let's begin. Who was Dionysos' mother? Oh, no. Uh, I want to say this first one here. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm really under the gun here. I've got a classicist who's an expert in Greek theater. Well, imagine it would be much worse if we stream me getting one of these questions wrong. So. <laughs> That's true. I'm, I'm, take, you on, I'm taking the bullet for the team here. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I think I missed that. Uh, you can ask her to repeat. See, this yeah. is quite a good thing. Which competitions took place on the second and third days of the Great Dionysia? Hmm. Well, that helped, obviously. Um, I would say drinking competitions. Dionysos was the god of wine, so there's no doubt drinking occurred during the festival. But it wasn't limited to a paltry uh, two days. Keep trying. Sadly. Oh, oh. But that's right. quite a good example of what happens if you get something wrong. You know, she gives you some extra information rather than just saying yeah. no. And then you have a chance to try again. Yeah. Um, so what is the answer? <laughs> <laughs> it's those dithyrams that we oh, mentioned. It's the okay. dithyrams first and then the drama. Ah. Yes. The theorem V were hymns. And see here, suddenly she explains it, but we could have done with that at the beginning. Yeah. You know, I wonder if they saved it for this kind of response. They felt like they didn't have enough information for Aspasia to say during these quizzes, so they kept it for that. Um, and again, I missed the question. I'm sorry I was talking over this. It's all right. Oh, uh, uh, I would Which say the, the rustic. I mean, rustic, old, right? I mean, let's see. The rustic Dionysia was not Ugh. the oldest Dionysia festival. By rustic, they just mean the one that happened in the countryside here, oh, I'm afraid. Great. Compared to the great Dionysia, <laughs> which happened in the city. Uh, okay, well, uh, let's go with that one then. The great Dionysia was one oh, of the largest festivals this is dedicated tough. to the god. <laughs> we talked over oldest. quite a lot of this information, so it's, That's it's true. fair enough that it's hard That's, to recall. Thank now. you for coming up with excuses for me. You are correct. All right, the there we go. The was the oldest Dionysia festival. Congratulations, Wanderer. You're a very uh, studious. I don't know if I'm very studious. I think I maybe might have passed. Uh, I quite oh. like that she's really nice, regardless of how you get through that quiz, however. Yes. There doesn't seem to be any then ramifications for getting all the answers wrong. Right. Well, it's not like they're going to have the Cyclops come in and murder you after failing nope. the quiz. Uh, Alright, well let's, before we go to the next tour, let's change our character. Do you have anybody in particular you'd like to, to see as the Avatar? Um... <sighs> Oh, Praxilla's quite cool. That's, we could be her. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Drinking songs. All right. So she's real. Yes. And there is a quest um, related to her. One of the, I think it's one of the Lost Tales, the quests they added oh, afterwards. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. In so, the game. Yeah. Oh, it's well worth going back and is playing. It? Okay. It, actually, yeah, they they've actually included some because, like a lot of poets of the period, um, we've only got kind of fragments of her poetry. We haven't mm -hmm. got whole poems, but they've included some of them um, as part of the quest. It's a really nice little extra for classicists or people who are interested in that kind of thing. It's a really nice, quite detailed way of using the material for geeks, I guess you could say, in the parlance yeah, you of could, the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> All right, well, were there any other tours that you wanted to check out? We've, we've done a theater one. I didn't know if there was something else along that line or um, any other themes. Do you want one I did like or one I didn't like? There's you, one that I found really quite problematic, actually. Well, it's uh, You're the guest, so you get to choose. Okay, then let's have a look at the life of Greek women. Oh, which daily I think life. you'll find under daily life. And yeah. I've I've done that one as well. I had some thoughts. Oh, interesting. Let's let's go to that. <laughs> so now this is in uh, where which city is this in? Is this in Corinth? Yes, Corinth. Yes. Yeah. 
on here as you're going to the loading screen, we've got these hints that come through. Now, in the game, these hints often involve different techniques you can use to uh, assassinate people. Uh, but here, they've taken the in-game hints and just made them the kind of little uh, historical asides that they provide the player in the regular game, and now this is the focus of Discovery Tour, so... Okay, here we are in Corinth, and we can take a look at the map. And so, last time we just went down the Acropolis, went down to the theater district, but here uh, we are in a, a whole different area of uh, Greece. And still with the same tour guide, though. Welcome to Corinth, Wanderer. Yes. <laughs> I have a special visit planned for you today. It's an intimate, informative look into the daily lives of Greek women. What do you think of this place? It's amazing what women could accomplish while men spent all day trying to out-debate each other at assembly meetings. Their mm. work should be far more appreciated on the whole. Mm. But we're going to acknowledge that now. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, little bit of so. a little bit of virtue signaling there. Uh, but then okay. also this idea that men are just debating all the time. Yes. Uh, um, I mean, you know, it's certainly... This is what I found so frustrating about this tour. Um, and again, this is something about as something the game does quite well is kind of engaging with um, the realities or indeed not realities of women's lives in ancient Greece and kind of there's a lot of representation of female characters um, there's women kind of all over the streets and so on as part of these NPCs um, including women weaving which is something this tour will touch on so they've obviously kind of paid attention to that and that's a really good thing mm -hmm. But how much Gordon they've paid attention the to that once you get in into the place. tour is it where I start to have problems. Right. Of 90, in my times, and much of that population was made up of women. This tour will shine a light on those women and look at how they lived on a day-to-day -day basis. Look for me when you're done with your visit and we can discuss things further. So one thing that I would say was positive about this particular tour, and we'll see this as we go through, is that this tour makes pretty good use of the surrounding NPCs to illustrate oh. some of the elements of the tour. So uh, just before we uh, Young girls dump all over this tour, <laughs> 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 this... Uh, yes, like does, this. This is yes, really nice. This is Having good. This is, good. This is useful. Of children's quarters of the house, the Gunaikon where they spent their time spinning threads and weaving. While there is not much historical evidence of young girls at play, especially compared to boys, it was still known to happen. For example, an ancient terracotta group depicts two girls playing Ephedrismos. This was a competition to see who could strike an upright rock from afar using a pebble or ball. The game's loser had to close their eyes and carry the victor until they manage to touch the same rock with their hands. I don't know why we've switched to a male narrator here, incidentally. I find mm. that quite interesting. I don't mm. really know how that choice was made. So this, I mean, actually, that's quite a good example of something which we'll see for the rest of um, that extra information gave us some information about Corinth. Mm -hmm. It didn't give any more information about young girls and their lives. Yes. And that was, yeah, a problem as you've you talked about before, but that was a problem with quite a few of the tours that I've noticed, especially this one, where it felt like it wasn't stitched together as well as it probably could have been. And we'll notice here as we go through the tours that as far as the life of Greek women it kind of jumps around subject matter a bit in a way that would feel really odd if you were going through, say, a museum or even a textbook. For a young Greek woman, marriage was the culmination of their induction into society. The average life expectancy for women was about 40 years. So most marriages took place when the bride was 14 or 15 years old. The marriage did not require her consent either. Instead, she was passed on from the protection of her father to that I of I love her these husband. two men standing here, so Married you can be sure. Not the music is a little ominous as well. Yes. <laughs> ...that came with official citizenship. 
However, they did receive a dowry that only they were allowed to spend. But in the event of a failed marriage, the dowry was returned to the bride's father. After the marriage was consummated, the woman's status changed from being a maiden to a bride. She remained a bride until the birth of her first child, wherein she officially became a woman. So just from the outside looking in, that felt like a pretty useful, uh, short and sweet description of uh, marriage uh, and uh, women's role uh, in mm. Greek life. But then here we get the extra information and there's nothing. There's right? all... Everything's yeah, so in this... the transcript. <laughs> yeah, this is where I start actually getting really irritated mm. with this story, I'm afraid. Because firstly, there is so much less information in this extra information than there has been on any of the other things. Okay, we've only looked at two others. Right. But there, this is the shortest blurb I've seen. Yeah so far and i've only done a few extra tours beyond that but the kind of the tendency towards much less information in this tour is for me quite marked mm -hmm. um and it doesn't need to be the case because the other thing that frustrates me about this tour is that they did mention they were going to focus on corinth and they bring it up here but in the kind of overall voiceovers the narrator parts um they don't specify that they start talking about greek women for a greek woman this is the reality yes it isn't the same across all of greece and again this is something we talked about in our last podcast Cast. Yes. The situation for women in Sparta was very different because they could own property. Um, even the marriage age seems to have been different. Uh, how much impact these sort of things made on their lives was quite different. So that was something which the game could have really productively explored, given yeah. that it has both Athens and Sparta as kind of key areas of the game. Yeah. And they just didn't at all. Women Everything is completely generalized. Cities were essentially forbidden from participating in political life. Here, and for example, yes. ancient their Greek lives cities. Were controlled yes. by men. Their most important responsibilities were running the household and giving birth to children, preferably boys. Most of the time, women's excursions outside of the house were limited to visiting other female neighbors, as per custom. The few exceptions to this strict rule were weddings, funerals, and religious festivals involving women in prominent public roles. And then there's a further generalization which comes up once you start hearing employment, which is a kind of class difference. Mm -hmm. um, even in Athens, it seems quite likely that women are from less rich families would have been involved much more in kind of doing things or running things. Um, in one of Aristophanes plays, um, the women at the Thesmophoria, which is a, a religious festival, there is a woman who runs a stall and she sells myrtle uh, to make wreaths with. So she's, you know, she's an economically active woman. Mm -hmm. um, and the point of the joke is not that she runs a stall, it's what she says about, what Euripides says about women, i.e. she's just a normal character. It's not yeah. meant to be funny that there's a woman with a job, it's just yeah. part of normal life. Mm. And that's because she's not a rich woman and she talks about the fact she's not rich um, and her, I think, I can't remember, I think her husband might be dead. Um, but, you know, she's clearly, she's a sort of lower class woman, so she's got a trade. Um, we don't know how enormously widespread that was, but we, we certainly don't think that all of women, from whatever social strata they were, did nothing except stay at home and weave, because some families couldn't really afford to live like that. Yeah. So this would have been a really good place to go, and again, the blurb's quite short, just to say, for rich women in Athens, this is the reality. Yep. There is some evidence to suggest that for poorer women, that isn't necessarily the case, especially because in this game, they've got quite a good range of, of different people doing different things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the it's, NPCs show women of all different exactly, social classes, don't exactly. they? Exactly. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a good uh, counterexample to this, you know, if we're talking about class. Uh, in Athens, where you can go and take a tour of a Greek home, and it's uh, Pericles' home. And so... Mm you get kind of a view of upper class life and I'm not sure how much they stress that point that it's, you know, this is an upper class home, but here, you know, you've got kind of working class communities, what they're doing, how their families are living. Uh, so, you know, for the player and maybe in the context of a classroom, they would get that understanding of, you know, this is different classes. This is uh, different scales uh, within Greek society, which would, I think, be useful. And the NPCs mm. are carrying a lot of water here. Uh, mm. Not not literally, I don't know, I don't see anybody carrying water, but, you know, uh, intellectually, uh, academically, they, they're doing some good work, I think. Yes, Making but if you don't draw attention to that, yes. it's difficult to know how many of the audience is going to pick that up. Yes, yes. ...to manufacture clothing for each of her family members 
as well as to weave other household textiles. Women Again, it's worth saying that this doesn't seem to have been the same for Spartan women. Mm -hmm. And weaving in general was seen as a very attractive quality. For example, Homer describes Odysseus's devoted wife Penelope as spending most of her days weaving at the loom. Similarly, many Greek vases depicting women weaving were combined with images of a woman holding a veil, which was seen as the symbol of a bride. So again, that's useful uh, for the NPCs to be there. They weren't really doing much of anything, but again, if we're thinking about this, comparing it to other popular histories, um, say a, a coffee table book or documentary on television, uh, I think this compares pretty well, um, you know, because you can make use of the game environment. Uh, you can make use of the NPCs to illustrate directly what you're talking about. And you're also leaving it up to the player you know, which tours to do, what, you know, to, to explore what they're interested in, and to mm. go off the beaten track uh, and look into some of these buildings and look at uh, some of the activities of the the NPCs. So, I don't, I don't, for myself, at least, I think that's, that's something to recommend this uh, Discovery Tour mode. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, and I think particularly the fact that they've got those sort of women working the loom um, when they're talking about weaving is is good i don't you know I, i'm coming across a little bitter here and it's shame greek women this is, you know, it's just this particular tour However, on the whole i think discovery mode does some things really well and yeah they also but i have some frustrations with this one in particular in sure courtyard. this was also where women performed other domestic activities these activities were rarely seen by visiting men or passers-by because the architecture of classical Greek We've got some great documentary set up here where mm. they're talking about how this is hidden work and we're looking work. from behind a fence. That's it's not bad. It is. It's very good. But again, you know, yep. ancient Greek cities, ancient yes. Greek architecture. Yes. yes. It's a shame. It feels like a wasted opportunity to me mm -hmm. because so much of this is so good. These women working, it, it, you know, is great. So I would have just liked just a, a little bit more of a push away yeah. from that. Yeah. I've got to say, I'm. This bread does not look very appetizing. Um, <laughs> None of the food in this game looks very appetizing. Yeah, I know. The wine looks pretty good, I think, but yeah. the food, no. The historian Strabo relays that the Temple of Aphrodite was one of Corinth's most famous landmarks. This was largely due to the temple's female patrons. These hetairai, as they were called were donated to the goddess by both men and women. According to Strabo, the temple of Aphrodite contributed greatly to Corinth's wealth. The Hittirai were the temple's main attraction, and many visitors came to Corinth in search of their company, for which they spent frequently and frivolously. So just quickly, this is a bit what I was talking about at the beginning of this tour, where it feels like this tour is a bit of a hodgepodge and here yeah. we've had all this talk of greek women we've had some mention of uh, the particular circumstances in corinth in the extra textual information but then here at the very end of this tour we get just a big discussion of uh the temple of aphrodite in corinth itself and it feels very disjointed i don't know what did you make of this uh this ending to this tour kate yeah, I agree. And notice again, by the way, how ridiculously short that is compared to some yes. of the information we got of other things. Look, and again, the transcript uh, yeah. is longer than the extra information. Um, yeah. Um, which, compared that's... to the previous version of Discovery Tour, there was no extra information, so this is an improvement, but again, it's it, like you've mentioned before, it seems like a wasted opportunity. Mm. And what's quite interesting, actually, is they come back to the... If you do the Gods and Love Tour, I think it's called... Um, they come back to the temple. That that is a very peculiar. That's another one which, unfortunately, I didn't. I found very disconnected from sort of the geography of the game. Mm. Um, they come back to the temple of Aphrodite, and in that one, they mention that Strabo is a bit of a problematic source for this, and there's some mm. doubt about what actually the role of these satyra was and who they were. They're really explicit about it, but in this tour, same information, no indication that there's a problem with the source here. Wow. Yeah, gosh, so that if, is quite interesting. Yeah, it's it's almost like there are these moments, and I haven't played all the way through all of these tours, but there are these moments where 
you know, the, the information that you would hope would be here is in a different tour, and we had that same sensation with, uh, uh, you know, what the tour of the theater, and then also with the mm. Acropolis, where if they just kind of brought that information in, you know, just as an extra clause or an extra mention, um, mm. extra sentence, that that would have been enough. Um, yes. And maybe, I don't know, I mean, maybe they feel as though it's too much for a transcript. Maybe they feel like they don't want to reuse the same information over and over again. I, I don't know. But it's, it's I mean, I find it particularly strange in this ex because it is quite clearly there in the other tour. Yeah. So it could be that they don't want to repeat themselves. But what that's actually led to then is that the other tour is is just on this particular bit of information is more useful than this one on the exact same point. Yeah. yeah. So if you're going to cover the same point, really why not cover it the best way you can on both of them rather than correctly on one and then peculiarly peculiarly omitting all that kind of extra information that you've done mm -hmm. right in the mm -hmm. other tour it seems like a very strange choice to me mm -hmm. i mean if you've done something right you might as well repeat it over and over again yes yeah That's, why not yeah yeah i mean maybe they're worried about people doing all of the tours and getting Hello repeated again, information one. but i hope your visit was i mean this is quite a different tour otherwise Great so i don't think that was a huge risk yeah. compared to men but throughout it all, they held on to their strength. This is quite a strange <laughs> sentence as well. What does she mean by that? <laughs> what is she talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, do you want to take the quiz for this one? I don't mind. We could do it if you like. Uh, let's let's uh, move on. Uh, I think we've we've <laughs> said enough. So sure. thank you for visiting about quote unquote place. Greek women uh, in general <laughs> taken taken together. Yes. All right. Well, as these people bake bread, uh, let's move on. And uh, I should mention very briefly, there is a section over here to the left in the menu for the tours uh, that has suggested tours. So this uh, kind of gives you an opportunity. If you don't know where to go next, uh, the game kind of points you in the direction of another topic that might be of interest based off of what you've already done. Um, and this is quite good because you can... Uh, when you go through the tour guides, when you talk to Aspasia or any of the other tour guides, um, you can select the next suggested tour from the end of that tour. So uh, you don't even have to go through the process of going into the tour menu. You don't have to travel via the map. Uh, you can simply jump in uh, to the next tour immediately if you want to do a bunch of these all at once. So where are we headed next, Kate? Um, I don't really mind. Uh, the we shouldn't having just done a bad one. Let's skip gods and love because that is, unfortunately, <laughs> that is the information is good. It's got a lot of interesting myths attached, but it is completely disconnected from the geographical context mm -hmm. it takes place in. It's just some inter information about myths in Corinth. Mm. Um, we could do one of the other Athenian ones. They okay. tended to be better at this. Okay. Uh, which which one in particular? Um, I've done Athenian democracy, which I quite liked. Okay. Let's do um, that one. I have. I don't think I've done that. No, I've oh, okay. only done philosophy. So let's let's go visit Pericles. Hmm. This is quite early on. This has got an example of kind of exactly what these tools should always be doing, which mm. I'll flag up. So that Great. Was, this is a nice one. <laughs> Good. This uh, this loading screen always reminds me of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I don't <laughs> yes. know. If, yeah. Yes, we're going back in time. To yes, happen. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh, here we go. I I. I promise, viewers, that there are other tour guides uh, besides the Spacia. <laughs> yes, this is a weird Welcome thing, because I, I picked it almost randomly, and I kept ending up with Aspasia. Yeah. Which is <laughs> interesting. Let's see what she thinks of this place. The battles fought here may be more intellectual than bloody, but they are no less spectacular. These outcomes will affect Love the, the sunlight entire city here. in a different mm. way. Something which is quite interesting, actually, about these tours on the light is that it can get dark if you stand around on a tour. Oh, really? And you don't do it. Yeah, the sun will go down, and you'll have to do the tour in the dark. Oh. Or if you play the game and know the know the kind of meditating command, yes. then you can make it day again. But I do wonder whether some people 
just kind of doing the discovery tour who don't know the game are going to be doing their tours in the dark yeah. thinking this is a bit <laughs> i i should mention i did uh the uh, kind of greek mythology tour of uh, theseus and the minotaur and you know you go down underneath the palace and you can use um a directional pad uh, to bring up a torch and mm. so that com provides a little bit of light but still it, it's pretty dark down there and, and you know it's it's a kind of an interesting element, you know, you feel a little bit more um, present, I guess, historically, mm. but at the same time, if it was an actual museum, <laughs> it would be odd to have just yeah. this dark corridor that you'd be going down. I think for that, I can really see why you do it. For the ones that take place outside, I'm a little bit surprised that they let the keep going up and down. Yeah. I would have thought that the would be something to just turn off. The place of the Athenian Assembly and the physical embodiment of democracy at work. This tour will give you insight into how citizens made decisions and kept the city running. We can talk more when you have finished the tour. See you soon, Wanderer. Okay. The Athenian Assembly was known as the Ecclesia. It met at the Penix 40 times a year to discuss various civic matters, and each session usually lasted a few hours. I love the this, this fantastic view of the space that you get from this pan. I think that's really together. well done. This was probably a reference to the fact that during meetings of the Ecclesia, the location would be filled to its capacity, with citizens packed in practically shoulder to shoulder. All male citizens were allowed to directly participate in the democratic process. Those over 20 years old had the right to speak and vote, while those over 30 could be elected to the higher position of magistrate. In total, there were approximately 30,000 citizens in Athens in the Classical period. To draft and adopt decrees, 6,000 of them had to attend the meeting. Hmm. Which is quite an interesting disparity if you think about it. Absolutely. This is great. I love these archival um, pictures, yeah. Yes, and there's a really good example of one that we're going to meet in a moment. Oh, okay, I'm excited. Which, <laughs> which is my highlight of all of these tours, I think, actually. Yeah. I've written in my notes, this is how this should work. So. Yeah, oh, well, okay. Um, you know, just briefly, you know, you'd mentioned being able to pan around the space and visit oh. it. I mean, this is this is kind of a dream, really. I mean, for... Uh, public scholars, but then also those who uh, teach these topics in class. I mean, not just to have a documentary where you're panning around uh, a historical reimagining of this space, but then also be able to let the player, the student, go and run around and look at this stuff mm. and kind of imagine themselves in this space. I mean, it's uh, it's really incredible uh, in that in that sense. I think. Yes, and I've actually, even before this tour came out, I have used some images from this game. Um, mm -hmm. I used images of the theatre, actually. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything they've done in the theatre, and I have some doubts about the way they've set up the stage building, for example. But, in, but nonetheless, it's one of the best kind of ways of thinking about a reconstruction of space, because they've tried to make it like a space that people live in. Yeah. Whereas if you look at ruins, or if you look at a kind of um, archaeological diagram, you're looking at a sort of 2D, um, this is what is here now. Yeah, it's quite different. So as a way of helping students think about what the space might have been like, how people might have fitted into that, what they would have seen around it as well. The fact that this is not just the Pnyx or it's not yeah. just the theatre, but that you can see, oh, yes, from the Pnyx, look, I can see the Acropolis. I mm -hmm. can kind of look around and be impressed by that statue of Athena. I can, you know, effectively, I can come to my assembly, listen to laws about Athens and see that statue. Yeah, That's an experience we can't get now because the statue isn't there anymore. Yes. But you can point it out to students with this kind of reconstructed atmosphere and I think that's really that is a huge advantage of this kind of way of thinking about the locations yeah. Citizens came from all over Attica's 10 districts to attend the meetings of the Ecclesia. The meeting was presided over by an executive council called the Pritones. Every session began with a sacrifice to Zeus Agoreos, the patron of the assembly. During the meeting, citizens delivered speeches from the Penix's platform on whatever issues the city faced. Afterwards, the issue was voted on with a show of hands from the gathered assembly. 
the Ecclesia made important decisions about subjects like grain importation, expenses, and declarations of war. While they could not directly enact laws, they had a say in appointing Athens legislators, which gave them a large role in shaping the city's daily operations. So something else that I really like about these little kind of blurbs on this one is that they've done much better with the vocabulary again. Mm -hmm. Everything is being kind of clearly defined, in, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. A little reference to Aristophanes here. Um, yes, yeah, I like this. Although, again, unfortunately, this is where you start to get kind of here is some information which is not obviously related to what we were talking mm, about. Yes. The information about women in religion. I'm not yes, really I was just sure reading that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I just wonder. Maybe it's made sense from their research notes to put it in this way, but it does feel a little disjointed. If we were to think mm. of this again, comparing it to say a museum experience, which I think is the the closest comparison point to this, um, yeah. it would be odd to have this random mention mention of Aristophanes's comedy here with reference to democracy but um i don't know I, what do you think i don't so i don't mind the comedy so much i think you know because that is about the assembly but when it starts to get on to kind of women were priestesses I've, yeah, I've, okay. I've lost the thread here a bit yeah. what i would prefer actually is more information about this fantastic picture we've got of the platform from the pnix mm -hmm. behind it i would you know if if I'm kind of showing this to my students, if I I try and think about it in terms of if I were teaching this, yeah. If I were teaching it, I may well put up that picture. I might well talk about the play because that's quite interesting for how people thought about the assembly and its workings. I wouldn't suddenly start telling my students about women priestesses. Yeah, I would be talking about this stuff instead. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll do this little point, and then you're going to have to go to the back of the thing and look at the discovery well, point. Okay. some citizens only participated <laughs> in the sessions of the Ecclesia, others could become more involved in democracy as magistrates. Magistrates were elected from among Athenian citizens... Now, for third, viewers, you might be getting a little bit bored of seeing the same group of NPCs uh, randomly talking to each other. Much more sway over but again, comparing this to the last citizen, Discovery Tour mode, this is much better. Um, was Pericles, having who was so popular, uh, NPCs acting out some of this, years. it makes it more interesting, even if it's the same thing over and over and over again. And we had a nice reference there to Pericles who is up on the stage. Yeah, and here we've got this this extra information about yes. Pericles, which and is great. And, yeah. and again, I quite like that. Um, it's quite Some of this is quite nuanced. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so not so much the handling of Cleon, but when particularly when they're talking about Pericles himself, you know, they're quite careful to note that uh, Pericles championed reforms that limited the power of aristocrats, despite himself being an aristocrat. And they handle quite well in this tour um, how much political participation are we actually looking at from regular yes. citizens in the Athenian democracy. And all of those kind of just slightly more careful ways of ha handling the material are done, I think, in this tour much better than they were in the one we were just looking at. Yeah. Okay, so back here. Okay, so back to, yeah, back to that little discovery point at the back of the platform. I like how you go up the stairs like a civilized person. I just climb <laughs> straight up. <laughs> now look, this is brilliant. Here is this tiny, tiny detail, these fragments of, of pottery, and I'm kind of pointing at them on my screen, which obviously no one can see. <laughs> but, then, but then you look at it, and here are some examples of them that we've got in the real world and some mm -hmm. information about what they are they're just in in that kind of wider context they're a really small detail they're not immediately obvious but the game invites you if you're interested to look at them to kind of really appreciate this detail and then to see the real example right and i just think that's exactly what this tour can be really good at kind of connecting you to these these existing artifacts that many of us and many students particularly will be studying they'll be looking at these giving you the information and then showing you it kind of in a wider context and again it's kind of geographically connected these things taking place in this space right it's exactly what we should be thinking about mm. this is great wow yeah so this i really like i'm yeah. hugely enthusiastic about these little ostraca here these um, inscribed bits of pottery and look they're tiny yes you don't really notice them until yeah. you're kind of invited to look at them well you know it, 
you know, it makes you think there must have been a developer or researcher who was just really into this source. And it kind of shows the degree to which the developers um, take this stuff history and are, are interested in it. Because right? you wouldn't you wouldn't put a discovery point. You wouldn't put this uh, these broken pots back here uh, if if you weren't really interested in it or if you weren't really mm. interested in the history. So, yeah, um, absolutely. I think that's, and I think I mean, that's, I mean, sad as it is to kind of keep going back to the negatives uh, on such a high point, but I think this is what makes me quite frustrated about the others because wouldn't it have been great when we were looking at those uh, women weaving and we were talking about looms and so on to do the same thing with, yeah. for example, loom weights yeah. or, you know, some of the bits of looms that we've got in collections all over the world to talk about kind of the physical remains of women's lives as well. So hopefully yeah. in the next iteration, we'll get mm -hmm. this kind of detail all the way through. Yeah. And then it'll be fantastic. In theory, every Athenian. So this I like as well very much. Had the right In to theory, in yes. excellent. Assembly. However, some of them lived far from the city, and others could not financially afford to miss a day of work to attend meetings. For these reasons, the city introduced a special allowance called a misthos ecclesiasticos in the fourth century BCE, meant to encourage participation. Originally, it was two obols, but the politician Cleon raised it to three. And here you get a nice little picture of what an obol is, so mm. if you were wondering what that looked like after they mentioned it, here it is. So again, mm. this is connected, it all works quite well yeah. as an experience, I think. Right, and this, this tour in particular doesn't have the same kind of disjointed feel. Uh, mm. as the uh, Women in Ancient Greece tour did. Mm, absolutely. Athens introduced several innovations that heavily influence modern society. I don't like this bit as much, but I see why they've done it. ...and philosophy. However, their greatest contribution was their democratic government, mm. which introduced the concept <laughs> of a city ruled by its citizens. Mm. The decision to adopt democracy as a government a choice made in 508 BCE, shaped civilization as we know it and continues to affect us today. Hmm. Well, it's kind of, I mean, it works as a conclusion for them. Yeah. But as a historian, uh, the idea of democracy has changed quite a bit since this yes. moment. And I'm not sure if the player would be aware of those differences. Oh, here we've got, whoa, Thomas Paine. Oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> whoa. Um, so here, oh, my goodness. Well, as a so modernist. this is quite nice. Yeah, yeah. As a modernist, I can speak on this and say, you know, the conception of Athenian democracy, very popular in the early modern period, uh, and in particular during the, uh, period of revolutions in the late 18th century, early uh, 19th century, but their conception of what that democracy actually was was very, very different from even what we had uh, in the past, obviously, but then also what we have today. So, ooh, boy. I mean, uh, reading this, it looks like they've got some, but then they've got this, the most enduring part of Athens' democracy is the idea power rest with the people Ooh, that is mm. the people yeah i i the, what what frustrates me a little bit about this is they just told us they really just told us a that the people doesn't include women yes that it only includes athenian citizens and that also they were really good about pointing out that it actually in reality yes. only includes some citizens as well it doesn't include people who can't take time off work or who live too far away i mean some of the kind of rural districts of, of athens are really very quite far away you would if, particularly if you were walking, it would be a real struggle to go to a day in the assembly with it because you'd have to take you know serious time away from your farm. So, um, you know, you'd lose at least the whole day. It's not like just strolling down the street. So it's particularly people who live in the city of Athens have better access to yes. this kind of thing. And they were so good about pointing that out just a minute ago. Yes. And then and the then whole, in the, in the, yeah, and saying it's in theory and then also yes. mentioning that for a quorum to have a vote, you would only need a small fraction of those yes. people actually there to participate. Um, but then they seem to come here at the end and blow it all up. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
And I understand the temptation, right? Because this is one of the things that, I mean, we as classicists have been having a lot of discussion about this and field recently, the kind of, the des there's a lot of desire in modern society to say, oh, well, you know, we're like descendants of the ancient Athenians. We've, all our culture came from them and all our democracy came from them. And isn't that amazing? And isn't classics amazing therefore? And a lot of us are pushing back against that kind mm -hmm. of as being deeply problematic and having mm -hmm. led to some deeply problematic um, ways of thinking about the modern world and ways of thinking about the past as well. Right. Um, I understand that it's attractive. I just think it's a it's a bit of a shame because they did everything else so well right. that they've suddenly come back to here. Mm. Hello again, Wanderer. But it's fair I enough. I can see that if you're not so bound up in bait, it yeah. might not matter so much. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Okay, I'm gonna skip the quiz here. <laughs> Very well. Farewell, Wanderer. Notice that it's getting quite dark behind us, Basia. Though. Yes, and so to show off the uh, meditation mechanic, if you don't like the uh, the setting that you're in, you can hit, uh, at least on this controller, uh, if I remember what it is. I think it's... Select. It's M on a keyboard. Yeah, there we go. And you can meditate, and you can go to nighttime, and then you can go to morning or day. And then you've got you've got the light with you. Um, any other tour that you want to go through? I I did before we ended. Uh, I did want to go and look at the battle tour. Uh, one of okay, the battle great. tours quickly. I don't know if you had a chance to do that. I haven't, but let's have a look at it. So this is really interesting, and um, you can see here they've got a kind of an odd selection. I feel like mm. of tours. You've got Spartan Education, but then you've got particular battles um so i i suppose spartan education makes sense i feel like this could almost go in another topic like famous cities or daily life even yeah or perhaps it's even quite, philosophy it's, um it's, yeah it's quite interesting that sparta has been kind of split out of daily life isn't it that's again what i was yeah. saying with the women you know it would it's it's a shame that they haven't taken the opportunity to show off all their Spartan knowledge in some of those other sections. Yeah, yeah. And put it here instead. So let's go. Uh, what I want to illustrate is pretty well uh, represented in Marathon or Thermopylae. So you you pick which which one would you like to hear about? Um. Oh, let's go for Marathon. Okay. <laughs> here we are, Bill and Ted again. <laughs> No napkins. Fascinating. <laughs> All right, and finally, finally, we have another tour guide, and he's our old favorite. Hooray! Herodotus. Herodotus is my favorite. Welcome, traveler, to the site of the legendary Battle of Marathon. My name is Herodotus, and I am a traveler from Harikanassus. I retrace the cause of various events, such as wars and great calamities. I describe what I see and record what I'm told, all with the aim of providing a better understanding of why these things occur. Look for me to introduce you to many sites. <laughs> Except anything having to do with Athens, I suppose. <laughs> yes, apparently. But that, I mean, I quite like that the, the advantage we have with Herodotus rather than Aspasia is that we can at least, you know, that is quite closely what Herodotus says he's going to do in his history. Yes. So I don't mind that introduction so much. It's you know, truly it's, incredible. That is probably that what he would have said about himself. <laughs> have such tremendous significance. But then again, even the tiniest pebble can send ripples through the water. Okay, I'm less sure about that. Marathon Excellent. was the location of one of the greatest battles in Greek history. It was here where Athenians made a stand against the might of an imposing Persian fleet. Your visit will take you through the causes of the conflict, the battle itself, and its far-reaching consequences. I will see you again once you're through. Farewell for now. So I don't think we need to go through this entire tour in case there's any other uh, topics you want to touch on. But I did want to show some of this 
uh, to her because of the way they present battles, which I think, you know, comparing this version of Discovery Tour to Discovery Tour for Ancient Egypt, this game on the whole does a really good job with NPCs and using them um, to kind of illustrate historical events, but it does something a little bit different and I think controversial here with <laughs> battles. Okay. In 490 BCE, 600 Persian triremes landed on a beach 35 kilometers north of Athens. Standing in their way were 11,000 hoplites led by the prestigious Athenian general Miltiades. <laughs> the Persian forces outnumber the Greeks approximately 5 to 1, and yet the smaller force managed to push back their would-be conquerors. The Battle of Marathon was a major turning point in the Greco-Persian Wars, and the Athenians' victory would be celebrated for many years. The modern-day distance running event is named a marathon in memory of a soldier from the battle who ran back to Athens to announce their victory. Though whether this is real or legend is uncertain. There you got some uncertainty there. Yeah. So, instead of showing NPCs, we've got these floating flags, which I think makes sense if you're thinking about using this for younger students, right? I don't necessarily think you want to have the kind of grotesque violence that you usually see in Assassin's Creed games played out in a Discovery Tour mode, but at the same time I feel like they could have done some work to include uh, you know, NPCs fighting and kind of, or at least showing the soldiers on the beach. Maybe that would have been too much work, but I feel like that was a missed opportunity. I can't speak to the mm. particular history, but I thought it was very odd that flags replace humans here uh, when they are discussing battles. Yeah, it's quite strange. I mean, they they haven't been so squeamish when they're talking about, for example, Hetairai. Um, yes. Particularly in the Gods and Love Tour, the one we didn't look at, you know, they're quite explicit about whether or not these were or weren't sacred prostitutes. So they're obviously expecting either teachers to exercise some discretion or the audience looking at these not to be too young. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder why they didn't at least do something the for Persians the battle. I mean, even Greece just battle without its blood or something, yeah. which is an option that some games go in. Yeah. Um, you can turn on or off blood spatters for more graphic experiences. Yeah. Something something that was kind of not extremely violent, but represented surrender. people would have been quite interesting. Yes. yes. A solid foothold to carry out a large-scale invasion. I quite like this, in though, the sense of the BCE, terrain that they're the trying to present. Mm -hmm. revolted against its Persian rulers. They were aided by Athens and the nearby city of Eritrea, and even burned down an important this is a bit Persian peculiar. temple. Is <laughs> King Darius was enraged by their sacrilege. And in we could have had people for that, couldn't we? I, I think so. That's my feeling. Cities demanding their even just a kind of a, a picture of a Persian king. They've got one. They've used yes, it in they the do. game. Yep. Kind of shaking his fist or something. The Persians began their attacks, first capturing the city of Naxos and enslaving its inhabitants then taking the city of Eritrea. Filled with confidence from their string of victories, the Persians set their sights on Athens. And then you've got a, Athens in the background there. And, you know, for oh, reference yeah. on the map here, we we're just kind of northeast, north northeast of, uh, of Athens here. But yeah, the flags. And you can see, here, here we'll go a little bit further. I think the battle starts in the this Greeks next were one. The surprised by the ferocity of the Persian attacks. Seeking aid against the upcoming invasion, Athens was forced to appeal to other cities for help. In a surprising move, they asked for aid from Sparta, Whoa. known for having the More flags. army in Greece. <laughs> it's not totally clear to me what the flags are meant to represent, though. Are they kind of one company each, or have they just Apollo randomly Chaos, chosen the number of flags? Or I think they've the randomly the chosen them. Moon. Again, that's a bit of a shame. Athens if you're going to use Italia, them to symbolize something, the then city of it would have been a good opportunity to use them to really symbolize something. Yep. Yeah. This was the first time in Greek history that their entire civilization was under attack from an external invader. Despite sharing the same language and same religion, Greek city-states had often warred amongst themselves. The Persian invasion was the first time they realized the necessity of collective action to ensure their survival. 
And, I mean, this portrayal of the battle with flags, it's not so dissimilar from what you'd see from a mid-20th century documentary film or a mm. television segment. But nowadays, it would be very odd to see something like this uh, on, you know, a public history uh, channel, popular mm. history uh, channel. There would be more detail. There would be soldiers. There would You'd have a sense of what they wore, how they fought. Um, and so to not have it here the in this game originally planned to is, land at I, I just think, very strange. However, mm, the it's an odd choice, given how much attention they paid to... Uh, as you say, to people to in other places, but also, you know, little details and so on. To deploy cavalry. I'm not the sure it would have been so taxing technologically, even if you just had kind of static figures there. Yes, this yes, the yeah. To At the very least, the beach, right. While Athens hmm. scrambled to mount a defense. Yeah, I agree. This use of flags is very peculiar. Okay, let's see what happens when the battle actually starts. I thought it was happening earlier, but I think this the is Persians it. The Persians' overwhelming numerical superiority forced the Athenians to get... Let me skip ahead The a city bit. sent 10,000 hoplites, along with the extra 1,000 Plataean reinforcements. Once in position, Athenians had to... Athens strategists believed the former option was better. First strike... As the Persians had their backs to the sea. In the end, Miltiades' opinion prevailed, and the Greeks made their move. Okay, this is going to be the battle, I hope. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. According to Herodotus, the Greek forces charged at the Persians without archers or cavalry. The Persians were unprepared for what they saw as an act of madness. Oh, the humanity, the flags. <laughs> They were eventually pushed back to their ships. Oh no, look, they're all intermingled. Oh no. The no, the flags fell over. Oh. oh. With approximately 6, yeah, this is, this is just stupid. It's difficult to take the it seriously. The <laughs> oh, they're trampling over their own forces. No. <laughs> so that gives you a sense of flag mm. combat in case you were wondering. Uh, and given that, that you're that. going to, I mean, given that you're going to then include paintings like this one, yeah. where there are in fact dead people, that seems, I mean, that seems like a very strange and horses being stabbed. Me. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I just, I think if it was about not showing violence, that's fine. But I think there's ways that you could incorporate the NPCs into that mm. depiction. Um, I don't know. That's again, it's kind of like. You know, some of this description of the battle, I think, is actually pretty good. And they're saying approximately, you know, uh. we're not sure. Um, and it gives you a graphical uh, sense of what the battlefield looked like, um, you know, where it is geographically, um, yep. which is useful. But at the same time, if they, I feel like if they just gone that extra little step, mm. maybe it's not a little step, though. You know, I, I'm not a game developer, but it does seem like there's another, another way this could have been done. I think, I mean, to some extent, we've got the same, although it's not so obvious, we've got a little bit of the same problem bringing up earlier in that it's difficult to tie this to anything which is kind of geographically inside the game. Once you've shown the location, which is good, you can't do anything more than that. Um, you know, there's not uh, particular forts to show us or something because none of that is really relevant. Mm -hmm. So they had to, they obviously had to do something for a visual representation or they felt they did. Yeah. Um, in a way which for the others they could, you know, do a panning shot of a temple or something. Um, but if I were them, I would have just gone with, gone with um, as you say, you know, an, a Persian NPC and an Athenian NPC standing next to each other or yeah. something, just to kind of show some of the things that might be involved, perhaps. And, and, you know, they've done so much work on the soldiers. For those of you who don't know the the game, uh, outside of Discovery Tour Mode, there are so many battle sequences, and there's so many battles in which you participate in, and there's so much detail that's gone into the depiction of those soldiers, uh, you know, during the Peloponnesian War, but also, uh, you know, historical soldiers show up. There's uh, a DLC where you've got um, uh, Persian soldiers uh, oh. showing up. So they've done the work, and I just wonder, why not show it? You know, even if it is without the the blood and the actual combat, why not just show the NPCs here? I, I'm i a little befuddled, yeah. so... Um, I agree. I don't, I mean, I don't think they needed to 
the battle being played out by NPCs. Right. I think that really would be way too intense. But I think this is this just looks kind of ridiculous, really, yeah. as an alternative. Yeah, maybe even just these stick figures with uh, the the armor on them. That would have been <laughs> would have been better yeah. <laughs> than the flags. I don't, I don't know. Um, well, uh, that does it for me. What, what are you feeling, Kata? You want to look at something else, or should we call it a day here? Um, no, I think you've covered key points quite nicely. Okay. Um, I think we're set. All right. Well, um, Kate, thank you so much for joining me on this episode, this live stream, I should say. Thank you for having me. It's been great. All right, and to our viewers, this uh, uh, this live stream will be archived on the History Respawn YouTube channel. Uh, go to youtube.com forward slash History Respawn, uh, and that'll be posted, I think, later today. The archiving from Twitch usually happens pretty fast, and um, I might even see if we can take out the audio from this and use it as a podcast. We'll see if that works. If not, then uh, too bad. But... Uh, Great. Thanks again for joining me. And um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just, just going to add. You might want to recommend to anyone who's seen this but hasn't seen the podcast we did of the game itself. Oh yes, yes. Um, you might find that interesting as well. We yes. talked about kind of some of the decisions made in representing the Greek world in the game as well. Yes, so. uh, as Kate mentioned, uh, we have got a, a traditional history respawn episode on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And that went up uh, around this time last year. I think it was in fall mm. of last year. So you can find that on the History Respawn website, historyrespawn.com, or uh, you can find the YouTube version on our YouTube channel, or we are also, uh, it's an also a podcast, uh, which is can be found on just about any podcast device or podcast app that you use, iTunes, um, SoundCloud, uh, Overcast, all of these different, uh, Podbean, I just keep referencing things, um, but uh, it's all there. Uh, it's all available. So uh, thanks for that mention, Kate. That's that's useful. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to shut down this stream, and hopefully it won't crash my computer.